Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson, and I have a very special guest today, former Congressman Robert Pittenger from North Carolina. Congressman Pittenger represented Charlotte, North Carolina for three terms from 2013 to 2019 with the focus on national security, foreign investment reform, tax reform, and religious freedom. He was the chairman of the Congressional Task Force on Terrorism and Unconventional Warfare and vice chairman of the House Financial Services Subcommittee on Terrorism and Illicit fi Finance. Congressman Pittenger received bipartisan recognition for his leadership on reforming the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, also known as CFIUS, C-F-I-U-S, and for elevating the issue of terrorism financing as another front on the war of terrorism. He attended the University of Texas and worked for 10 years as assistant to the president of Campus Crusade for Christ helping to bring the work of the organization to over 170 countries and later moved to Charlotte where he built the National Real Estate Investment Company. Most recently, Congressman Pittenger has authored the book, Character Matters, Personal Stories of 31 World Changers. And we'll get into that a little later on in the episode. But uh, Congressman Pittenger, thank you for being with us and thank you for your tremendous service to the country. Dr. Carson, it is always a privilege to be with you, better in your presence. I certainly enjoyed my time with you in Washington and when you came to visit uh, me in my district. Uh, you're, yeah. you're a great statesman and a wonderful person. Thank you. Now, you've had a pretty remarkable life both in and out of politics. And uh, you attribute a lot of your success to your faith in God. I can identify with that. Uh, can you give our viewers a glimpse of, of what your childhood was like and, and how you came to know Christ? Well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I did not grow up particularly in a Christian home. It was We went to church, but uh, uh, going to church, as you know, doesn't always mean that you're a believer. And, but we went there, and um, my parents uh, liked to party a whole lot and grew up around a lot of that. And frankly, I was drinking significantly beginning in the eighth grade. But my senior year of college, uh, I realized that uh, uh, God was smarter than I was. And uh, my best interest was to entrust my future to him. And I, I prayed a simple prayer, Lord, I give up. And uh, November 2nd, 1969, at 10.30 p.m. on a Sunday night, uh, I committed my life to him and said, you do with me what you want to do. Uh, I had made some successes, but lots of failures. Life was a roller coaster. But uh, Sounds like that was a pivotal, pivotal moment for you. Was there something that, that drove you to that uh, conclusion? Actually, it, that it was a... A young man, I was I was very much involved in my fraternity. Unfortunately, that was too much a part of my life in college. But uh, God did use that. And there was a young man I was rushing to join our fraternity, and I was trying to get him to join the fraternity, and he was trying to get me to join the Lord. So he, he was witnessing <laughs> to me in the process. And several months after he joined uh, our fraternity, then uh, I came to realize through his communication and sharing with me, what God wanted was my will, and he wanted me to trust him with my life. And so that's that was the process of how it happened. Well, how did you get involved with uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, and how did that impact your life? Well, uh, I didn't know much about the Bible at all. Uh, I went to Sunday school and church, but we really didn't study the Bible much. Uh, but I knew I needed to know more. And following my senior year in college, I planned to go back to go to law school. And my dad and brother were both attorneys, and I figured that was my path uh, prior to coming to the Lord. But uh, I went out to a, a Bible training program they had with Campus Crusade for Christ called the Institute of Biblical Studies. It was a six-week course. Now, I, I planned on going to it and returning back and going to law school. But um, the Lord had other plans, and at the, toward the end of that 
six weeks, uh, I realized that there was more I wanted to do with my life. And they asked me to move to Dallas to work on a meeting called Explo 72. And it brought 84,000 young people from throughout the country to Dallas for a week-long training that Dr. Bright led. And I was asked to go there and be the uh, community, community relations uh, director for that. So that, that was the beginning of my relationship with Dr. Bright. I worked for him for 10 years and was a remarkable man. I uh, have profound uh, respect for him. And frankly, he, he got me involved in the political world. He moved me to Washington where he wanted to begin a, a Christian mission called the Christian Embassy. And I was his advance man. I uh, went up there in 1975 in 76 and spent several years there advancing him. And that was, that was my beginning in the political realm as well. Well, you were obviously very young to have so much responsibility. That's great. But, uh, you know, you, you spent uh, time in the private sector, you were doing well, but what motivated you to run for Congress? I think I drank some bad water. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. Frankly, our former governor, uh, Jim Martin, a wonderful person, um, encouraged me to run in the early 2000s. The state Senate seat was a possibility of running in that. And he really encouraged me to, to do that. Said you, I had been involved with Senator Helms and, uh, Elizabeth Dole and, uh, worked on George Bush's campaign and others. But, um, uh, I had never personally entered any political campaigns, but that seemed to be the right timing. That was really the one thing I, I gave up. I was very politically driven uh, when I was in college. Uh, I worked for lieutenant governor and for a state senator all through college, and I thought you know, that was my ambition, but uh, that's when I, I really gave that up, realizing that necessarily you know, political power didn't necessarily make you happy, or neither did material wealth. So, um, but at that point, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And so I ran for the, for the North Carolina State Senate and won that seat and served in it three terms. Wow. Well, you know, you were also the chairman of the Congressional Task Force on Terrorism and Unconventional Warfare. Um, can you explain to our viewers what terrorism financing is? Yes, sir. And how do we combat that? Very important component in terms of our allowing our capabilities to restrict uh, the abilities of the of our terrorist groups. You know they require funding, and uh, like any uh, organization or mafia inclined, uh, they will use any means to procure the funding that they need. Uh, there's alignment today, for example, uh, a complicit relationship between the terrorist groups and the drug cartels in, in the Americas. You have uh, all types of illicit practices. Human trafficking is a major form of, of means for procuring funds for terrorist groups. You name it and they will do it. Uh, but they, they will... They need to source out major funding to to support uh, their organization and the people that work in it. So uh, what happened on 9-11, the, the incident itself did not cost that much, maybe half a million dollars. But the time and training and the people that went into it uh, cost much more. And these organizations, f for example, uh, Netanyahu is fighting Hamas and, and Hezbollah as well. Well, frankly, uh, Hezbollah in the early, in the mid 1980s was a, a, more of a fledgling organization. And they emerge now as being an organization with over a billion dollars in annual revenue. So uh, they are, they in their own right, not apart from the funding that they get from Iran, they have enormous capacities, as do the Houthis and as Hamas and others. So they, they, they resource out their funding through uh, illicit means. 
Well, th thinking about all those terrorists, what's your uh, assessment of the state of the uh, southern border of this country? Hmm. Well, it's very porous, and uh, we don't know. You know. Well, we do know who's come through. Over 100 countries have come through from all over the world. Um, Northern Africa, Middle East, um, every every major bad actor in the country has people who have come through our border. And that is an enormous threat and potential it's challenge. It's logical that we would be concerned about it, but it seems like the administration just, eh, it's no big deal. How, how can they do that? Sir, the only thing I can and I, I don't accept this is um, something that is the, the prudent measure, but, you know, politics uh, can be very devious, as you well know. And people, power is, uh, the lust for power will turn a blind eye to many things. And and those folks coming across the border are potential allies of the, of the party in power today. And they would like to see them ultimately uh, be aligned with them and, and vote with them. And to risk the safety of the people for political power. There's no other basis for it. Um, there's no justification for allowing us to have a, an open border. And it's a very sad and very tragic uh, potential harm to our country. I'll say. I've been talking about it for years, and it's really going to be serious. And I always say, if the terrorists aren't coming and planning something really big in this country, they're guilty of terrorist malpractice. Yes, that <laughs> couldn't be better said. Better opportunity. Well, they, as you well know, sir, uh, they, they look for their moment. And they're patient, and they plan, and they prod. And uh, they will wait for the right, right way to strike. And whether it's uh, multiple incidents at one time, we don't know. But there's absolute understanding by any thoughtful observer that they are they have not lost their intent and their focus in the destruction and annihilation of this country. Now, can you tell us a little bit about uh, EMP and our electric grid? Well, I think... Um, our, our better hope is, is found in the private sector. I have spent a great deal of time with energy companies. In fact, I hosted a, a forum in Washington many years ago to deal with that one subject. Uh, but we remain very vulnerable with that. And uh, I think um, we should be doing more as a government. But, but thankfully, uh, I believe that the energy companies uh, recognize the vulnerabilities are, are doing everything they can, everything that they can, to try to protect our, our these assets. What is going on with the Chinese and them buying up land? And what what exactly is going on there? Should we be concerned? Absolutely, uh, the Chinese are incredible strategists. Uh, we have uh, properties that part of my bill, the FIRMA bill that had passed back in 2018, was present was to prevent them from acquiring properties next to our military bases, where they could uh, access through their own um, uh, capacities, uh, technology capacities, uh, and listen in on in terms of what was being communicated. So uh, they are brilliant. In terms, in, in a devious way, for what they are seeking to accomplish in every possible way, uh, they have launched an all-out war on the U.S. We have not accepted that that they are at war with us, but they have they've already internally declared war on the United States, mm. and we we haven't recognized that yet. Well. If if we have an administration in place, it doesn't matter whether they're Democrat or Republican, but they allow things to occur. They allow a porous border. Um, you know, they they sue the state of Texas because they're putting up barbed wire to try to prevent 
the invasion of their territory. Is is there anything that can be done? It should be. Or do we just sit there and suffer the consequences of of having poor leadership? Yeah. Well, you know, Texas still has the right to secede. <laughs> when, when, they, <laughs> when they joined the Union, they joined under the condition that they could secede at one time. And frankly, back in the 50s, Governor Alan Shivers nearly did that because of uh, oil rights uh, off the, the Gulf Coast. And he won. He, he won the battle with the federal government in terms of getting the revenue. But uh, I, I don't know whether they're ready to secede yet, but they certainly have the right to do it. Well, you know, uh, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, John Adams' quote that, uh, you know, our country and our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Mm. Uh, what, what did people like George Washington know that our leaders today have forgotten? Wow, great statement. Frankly, that's part of the basis for writing the book that I wrote. Uh, on character mm. matters, uh, the you know, personal stories of 31 world changers. You know, Dr. Carson, when I was in Congress, I loved to bring people into the House chamber and allow them to see uh, how we operate and how we did business, but I had them look around the ceiling of the chamber and around, uh, going around the, the board of the ceiling were these silhouettes of major leaders of democracy th through centuries, you know, for 2,000 years. But on the back of the room, not a silhouette, but looking straight ahead, was a full picture of Moses, the lawgiver, <laughs> looking right at the speaker's podium. And, of course, above the podium is, in God we trust. They understood it. They understood that the, the cornerstone, the basis of our government was founded in, a, in, a, in a, had a biblical basis to it. Many, many don't know that, you know, when we, when the Congress first met, they met there, of course, in Statuary Hall. And Sundays, the Congress did not meet, but who organized the first church? And it was in the U.S. Capitol. In that room was Thomas Jefferson. And m many people thought he was a non-believer, but it was an evangelical type church. And it really is pretty amazing, you know, when you stop and think about it and you look at our foundings and you look at our initial document, the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. talks about our rights coming from our creator. Amen. And uh, if, if you're in any way objective, you look at a fledgling young country mm -hmm. with a bunch of ragtag militiamen mm -hmm. defeating the most powerful military force on earth. I mean, to think that that uh, was maybe just a coincidence, no, that, that was the providence of God. Absolutely. And uh, the story of the bulletproof George Washington. I love that. And the Battle of Brooklyn with the fog coming down and shielding. I mean, these are pretty amazing things. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of amazing things in my medical career sure. that I couldn't explain in any way other than divine intervention. And I'm I'm hopeful that at some point we will have a revival in this country. We've we've had four of them in the past. They all sort of centered around pestilence or war. Hmm. We kind of got both of those now, so this would be a really good time for another one. I think. What do you think? Yes, sir. I think there was ever the fundamental need in our country is a return to God. Every ism as dr eva hill used to say ever ism needs to become a wasm <laughs> and uh, my dear friend dr hill but uh you know there's a book that uh, george washington wrote called maxims of washington it used to be sold at mount vernon but i haven't been able to find it there in recent years but the book were his statements of what he said and so many of them brought reference to the scripture and uh, his, even his desire for his young men uh, who were under his guard and he was under his command uh, to lead a, a moral life and to be, uh, to have a higher calling. So uh, I, yes, we did have 
the clear statements from our founding fathers who chose uh, to live a godly life and to present that is the basis for all people. Well, what advice would you have for those Christians who have found it more convenient to keep quiet about their faith? Hmm. That's a that's a sad reality. Uh, I, I frankly have dealt with that all my Christian life. Uh, when I came to the Lord, it was so clear to me that I found something the rest of my fraternity brothers needed. I started witnessing every one of them. In a matter of two months, we had 35 guys coming to a Bible study. And the devil kind of whispers in people's ear, oh, they're not interested. They're not interested. Well, reality is, as Pascal said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that can only be filled by God himself. And so I, I think it beckons us to, to share what we have and to use the platforms that we have. And I, I pray for people who have a platform that they'll utilize it. Uh, I'm, I, I, I try to bring out folks from who have been successful and in their walk of life to help create a platform for them. And that's some of what I've talked about in my book and people that I've known through the years. These are just not stories about people. The people I wrote about were those who, uh, uh, chose to live, a, 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 had a great calling in terms of their life, but they made a huge difference. And it was because of the character that they had as individuals. I write of Margaret, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and all these individuals, they understood the precepts uh, of truth. When I first met Margaret Thatcher, I said, Lady Thatcher, we all know that you were the Iron Lady. You were there when the wall came down. Uh, you fought um, the unions, you fought the liberals, you, you, you prevailed immense, tremendous, you succeeded. But what we don't know is what made you Margaret Thatcher? What gave you the courage, the stamina, the conviction, the fortitude to keep fighting when even those in your party were against you? She said, Robert's my father. She said, my father was a Methodist Sunday school teacher. And he took me to church every Wednesday night and every Sunday morning to learn about Christianity and learn about the Bible. But he said, my father taught me three things about leadership that carried me through my time as prime minister. This was in 1993 when we had this discussion. And uh, I, she said, my father taught me, number one, determine the right thing to do. What is the principal thing to do in any given situation? Number two, with your whole heart, commit yourself to that objective, never looking back. And number three, with all your persuasion, with all your ability, seek to bring your friends and your colleagues to join you. How succinct, but very profound. And it, it carried her through her, thir her, her 11 years. Uh, we're back with uh, Congressman Pittenger, uh, who wrote the book, Character Matters, Personal Stories of 31 World Changes. We heard a little bit about uh, Margaret Thatcher before the break, and she was an amazing individual. But uh, you also uh, talk about the Grahams, uh, Billy and Franklin Graham. And, uh, you know, what leadership qualities did you find admirable about them? Absolutely wonderful family, all of them. Uh, Dr. Graham Franklin, his, his three boys, his daughter, uh, sissy, they, uh, I said about Dr. Graham, I first met him when he was at, well, 1971. I was 21 years old and I was his caddy in the Byron Nelson golf classic. Then he played golf with Byron and, uh, Arnold Palmer and Bob Hope. And I chased, wow. I chased golf balls all over the course for Bob Hope and Billy Graham. But that was my first contact and introduction to him. And then, of course, working for Dr. Bright, they met countless times and was with him many, many times over that period of time. And then through that, you know, of course, got to know Franklin and travel with Franklin in various parts of the world. But Dr. Graham lives the life he preaches. Um, he doesn't just preach about Jesus. He, he acts like Jesus. 
you know, I've, I've, in the multiple times I was with him, he was always thoughtful and gracious in talking about somebody else. He was never talking about himself or what his ministry was doing or whatever. But he was always interested in that other person and how they were, you know. And it just made you feel loved and respected and appreciated. And that was, it was contagious because his whole team became like that. Now, Franklin, he's a different kind of bird. Franklin is, is like his mother. Franklin will charge hell with a water gun. He is the most courageous, uh, bold. He will get out there and go anywhere for the gospel and to, and to give a cup of cold water to somebody. Uh, he is absolutely amazing. And his kids are just like that. Uh, all, all three boys are, uh, carry the Lord and just with great yeah. dignity. I've flown with uh, him as the pilot. I mean, <laughs> he's a great pilot. I enjoyed it very much. But uh, his father uh, had a uh, one of his rallies in St. Louis one time at the arena there with 55,000 people and he invited me to speak. Oh, great. They had a choir of 5,000. Yeah. It was just an amazing experience to be with him. And uh, it was very inspirational. I'll tell you a funny story if you want about flying with Franklin. He asked me to, he asked me to go to Moscow with him. I said, well, okay. And at the time he was flying a, a twin engine Mitsubishi, you know, prop jet, loudest plane in the world. So we flew from Hickory, North Carolina, to Burlington, Vermont, to Nova Scotia, and stayed overnight at a little place in Nova Scotia, a one-man operation, like a six-dollar motel. And we went to check in, and the phone rang. And this man answered, little man answered the phone behind the desk, and hello. Well, yes, he he's here, and he handled the phone over the counter to Franklin. And Franklin got the phone, and said hello. Uh, yes, Daddy. Yes, Daddy. Yes, I, I'm going to Moscow. Yes, Daddy. Yes, Daddy. I've got a pilot with me. Yes, Daddy. Yeah, Robert Pittenger, he's gone with me. And at that point, his dad said, Robert Pittenger? I thought he had more sense than that. <laughs> <laughs> he did have a sense of humor, didn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he knew Frank could go anywhere and do anything. <laughs> well, you know, another uh, one that you wrote about is somebody that uh, – had a real impact in my life, and that's Ronald Reagan, mm. because you know I was raised a Democrat, mm. and uh, I one day did something that Democrats are not supposed to do, and that is listen to a Republican. <laughs> I listened to Ronald Reagan, and I said, "Wow, he sounds just like my mother. Mm. The, the same values and principles." I said, he didn't sound like a horrible, hateful, racist person like they tried to characterize him to be. Mm. And uh, that was the beginning of my transition uh, politically. So he played a big role for me. But uh, what uh, what was your experience like? Because you, you actually had a chance to meet him. And uh, what was his leadership style like? Well, sir, I met him in 1980. I organized a, a meeting called the National Affairs Briefing. It was the first time that evangelicals had come together uh, to be politically involved. And uh, Jerry Falwell was involved in it, and uh, Charles Stanley, and many, Jim Kennedy, many people. Tom uh, Landry was honorary chairman. I asked Tom to, to be the, the face for it. But over 20,000 people came to Dallas to the reunion arena from 36 states. Uh, and Pat Robertson, of course, was involved as well. And so it was a tremendous time. But Reagan, I remember he made the comment, you can't endorse me, but I can endorse you. <laughs> and uh, he identified with those values. But as always, Ronald Reagan was gracious. You know, we talk about a civil discourse today. I mean, we need more Dr. Ben Carson's in the discourse. But Ronald Reagan had the same demeanor as you, sir. And he is, they would say about Teddy Roosevelt and Harry Truman, you speak softly and carry a big stick. When I first, when I first met uh, Gorbachev, I said, Mr. Gorbachev, what did you think of Ronald Reagan when you first met him? He said, uh, air traffic controllers. 
But I knew what he meant. Three months into the presidency, air traffic controllers said that they were going right. to strike. And Ray right. said, well, if you strike, I'm, I'm going to fire you. Didn't get up and banner and wave and scream and yell at them or say bad things about them. He just did what he said. He fired them. And so Gorbachev knew that he was a man who meant what he said. But his demeanor, you never saw Reagan raise his voice. Well, there, right. he, there he goes again. You know, <laughs> he was just a, a gentle person, a gentle, a, a real gentle man. And I, I think, but look at that. We consider Reagan the epitome of what a conservative president should be. I mean, we honor well, you know, Reagan. So many, so many people who equate calmness and niceness with weakness. Yeah. And that's absolutely not true. Not at all. Uh, a lot of us nice people have very strong convictions. Yes, sir. And uh, we don't compromise principles. It's okay, I think, to compromise on methods. Sure. How do you get to a point? And, and you know, that's what it should be about. And that's what used to happen in, in our Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Democrats and we had Republicans. They had different methods of getting to a place, but they generally wanted to get to the same place. Mm -hmm. Now they don't necessarily want to get to the same place. Now we have one group that is very interested in the rights of the people and a nation that is up by and for the people. Mm -hmm. And we have another one that is of, for, and by the government mm -hmm. and That's insinuates true. government to every aspect of our lives, which makes it more difficult uh, to work together. But I think if you try hard enough, you can find those areas of commonality and you can spend time also trying to convert others. That's right. You know, I, I say conversion, not coercion. Very, very, very so well said. Yes, sir. You know, you obviously have a lot of great people in this book, but uh, from your perspective, what traits do you feel that these great people have in common? Yes, sir. It's a wonderful question. I'd say there's several. Uh, number one is humility. While they were great in stature and capabilities, they, they never lost their sense of who they were is before God. Uh, they were humble people and very strong people, all of them. And I don't write, write just about politicians. I mean, I've got Kathy Lee Gifford in there and, and Michael W. Smith and a lot of wonderful folks. But um, uh, they had a a demeanor of humility. And then secondly, I would say that um, they all had gone through challenging times and they were not bitter people. They looked up. They didn't look at the problems in life and and go after other people. They, they, they kept looking in, in faith toward a future. And th that was in my epilogue in my book, I talked a lot about forgiveness and the need to forgive other people. Because I've been through my own challenges, enormous challenges. I, I had a two year FBI investigation. They looked through two million uh, documents of mine and they found nothing. But it was very stressful for my family. Yes. But you, you can't hold grudges in life. And none of these people, I think uh, it would be very true for all of them that they were free from bitterness. Uh, they, they didn't allow the weight of bitterness to, to carry on down. Yeah. Well, you know, the Bible said, vengeance is mine, says the Amen. Lord. If you allow yourself to be eaten up by hatred and mm -hmm. uh, revenge, you have wasted an enormous amount of talent that God gave you to do good. Absolutely. And uh, he'll take care of them. I've always seen uh, it gets taken care of. You don't have to deal with it. Exactly. I observe that myself. It's like asking you who's your favorite child, but uh, do you have a favorite individual that you mentioned in the book? Hmm. That is, 
my grandmother used to whisper in all of our ears, you're my favorite grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the grandchildren heard the same thing in a, in a quiet little moment. Uh, I, I, they all have different reasons. Uh, I, I love the conviction of Benjamin Netanyahu. He is absolutely remarkable. And my experience with him, uh, when I first met him, it was in 2013, I said, sir, this is when, of course, President Obama was president. I said, sir, you are the leader of the free world. And he is he maintains his strength with incredible amount of headwinds. And, and I, really, oh. I really respect people who uh, hold their own in a, in a thoughtful way, not railing mm-hmm. out and not accusing others, but just holding their own. And, and of course, Reagan was like that, and um, so many of these other people. Uh, Colin Powell was like that. You know, I, I really have a, a just a, a love and respect for all those who carried the torch for liberty and for freedom mm-hmm. uh, and for personal values that honor God. And it's interesting how in the Bible, God used all kinds of people. Uh, for his purposes. Uh, David, he said, was a man after his own heart, even though, you know, he did some pretty awful things. Um, But none of us is perfect, which is why we need a Savior. Amen. And and we need to trust in him, and we need to continue to strive to reach a higher plane in our lives. That's so important. And it's been such an important part of who we are as a nation. But uh, as we've become more secular and we've tried to push God out, we're spiraling downward pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can reverse that before the inevitable crash occurs. What are you hoping that people take away from this book? Yes, sir. Great question. I think my hope is that, frankly, I wrote it initially for my our 17 grandchildren. And I wanted them to know the character traits of some wonderful people I've gotten to know for the last four to five decades who had a remarkable impact on this world. And um, so I, I want them to know why, what was in in their life that enabled them to be so impactful. And to that end, that's why we wrote it. Now, my hope is that we can shed some light on this to future generations. Uh, I don't know what impact we can have currently, but God willing and by his grace, we'll continue. If he has mercy on us, uh, we'll continue as a country. And hopefully that somehow this book can get in the hands of some aspiring young people who want to make a difference in their life. And they can, they can learn from these individuals the character traits that enable them to have that type of uh, impact. What, wonderful. Well, you know, I, I do think the Lord is still with us. I always say, if he was willing to save Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of 10 people, mm. we should be okay. But uh, we got to do our part. Yeah. That's the important thing. Now, where can people get a copy of the book? Well, you're nice to ask. Uh, it's, it's real simple. Uh, go to Amazon and just put in their character matters, maybe personal stories. You don't have to put in the whole title, but it's character matters and personal stories of 31 world changers. But if you put in character matters and you can add my name to it, Robert Pittenger, or just character matters, personal story, personal stories, it'll come up. And do you have any closing thoughts you want to transmit to our audience? The thought I would like to leave is how grateful I am for you, Dr. Carson. Uh, you are such a genuine article of, of him. Thank God for you, and I pray that your borders will increase and enhance and your favor will continue. And uh, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that God has more in store for you in terms of a, vis- a visible uh, position in our country. And I just... Uh, I just want to express my appreciation for the example that you've been to me and and thousands of other people who look up to you. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, your life demonstrates that God has something for each of us. There, There's no such thing as an ordinary person. Amen. 
and uh, he has what people have to do is begin to examine their lives and think about the special gifts and talents that they have why do they have those and uh, how can they use them in their sphere of influence to make a difference and uh, there could be no better example than your life for that so thank you so much for your willingness to be with us today for what we continue to do and uh, I hope everybody will go out and get a copy of Character Matters Personal Stories of 31 World Changers. You know, that was fascinating, uh, having that discussion with uh, Congressman Pittenger. An example of someone who was leading a pretty normal life and decided that there was more that they could do, that there was more that they could do to enhance the lives of people around them through his work with Campus Crusade for Christ, later as a congressman with particular attention to the safety of our people. It's an amazing story. But God has something special for each one of us. He gives each one of us special gifts and talents. It's up to us whether we want to use them or not, and how we want to use them. And for your prescription for this week, spend a little time thinking about what are you particularly good at? What special talents and gifts do you have? And how can you use them in this new year, 2024, to enhance the lives of others around you? That's it for this week. Tell everybody about our podcast as we try to spread common sense. And uh, make sure that you subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget the cornerstone principles of faith, liberty, community, and life.